it leads really into our first question is uh, your recommended form to IPM surrounding indoor and outdoor, which is really what I'd love for you to dive into. And yeah, t- tell us what your thought process is around that stuff. B. Krillitop virus is a virus that's like globally found in tons of different crops. It's just one of those viruses that are super common and can go get into a lot of species. And this beet leafhopper is like basically the only vector of this virus. Aphids are they're the group of insects that is the most responsible for specifically viral transmission. And it is because their mouth parts have adapted to be like a lot of times morphology can be super helpful for general things, but morphology has also misled us in the past. What is ecology? You're here with Mark Batwell and Matthew Gates on Perfect Gardens TV. Please remember to like, share, and subscribe. Make sure to check us out on Instagram and Facebook. Our $2.99 membership is available on the join button below. And if you need a little more one-on-one, our VIP link is down below in every video description. Make sure to hit the join button on the bottom of every video. First off, Matthew, pleasure to have you on the Perfect Gardens TV. I would love it if you could maybe just tell us a little bit about yourself and what got you started and, and some of your passions. Yeah, sure, no problem. So my name is Matthew Gase. I'm an integrated pest management specialist, but I also like to describe my, my sort of strategy as like a holistic IPM, one that kind of looks at uh, various aspects of things like ecology and, and how in the natural environment, plants and microbes and um, other organisms like what we'd call pests sort of interact. And I use that information to sort of um, assist people with trying to mitigate or prevent pests from um, affecting them in the first place. And there's a bunch of different ways people can do that, but that's where I sort of couch uh, with um, research and also with um, experiential situations. So just to kind of regurgitate what you're saying a little bit. So basically you use natural predators to, to fight the pests that we don't want in the garden. That's a one aspect of it, but yes, definitely. Okay. That's really interesting. The, let's go from all areas. I was saying he, he likes to come from all different areas. So that's what's really cool about Matthew is he, he attacks from all different types of areas of thought process, kind of like you. It, it leads really into our first question is uh, recommend your recommended form to IPM surrounding indoor and outdoor, which is really what I'd love for you to dive into. And yeah, t- tell us what your thought process is around that stuff. So like, for example, if you have, um, obviously, if you're cultivating somewhere, you're cultivating in a place, right? Like, and so that location is going to have, you know, various sort of biases um, that will change your experience, right? Like, for example, if you're growing in a place where you uh, don't really have like a winter, you know, or like a really cold winter, um, that's going to be very different. Pest dynamics are going to be different through the ambient level of various like insects or, you know, pathogens, like when the seasons change and it becomes very wet, you know, certain things become more likely that you're going to encounter them. Or if you grow near a place where there's a lot of um, traditional industrial agriculture, that's going to sort of, um, you know, you're more likely to see certain kinds of pests and especially ones that are common for the crops that you're uh, growing next to, for example. So you look at all these different contexts about your your place, whether you're growing commercially or in a home growth situation. This is, of course, very important. You know, things like what are the plants that are growing on your uh, property? Uh, there are many situations where I've um, talked to people who they don't, um, like they're getting, they have a pest like rice root aphids, for example. And um, they might not be aware of the fact that the rice root aphid doesn't just feed on like cannabis plants. It can feed on and does alternate between various kinds of folks, like certain grasses and herbaceous plants, and also like tree-like plants, like um, like prunus species, like nectarines and, and almonds and things like that. And that in that family, that sort of genus of trees. And lo and behold, they happen to be near an orchard or they happen to be, you know, there's a lot of like rye grass and wheat and, and rice or, or some sort of wild plant that's just a weed that's just growing near their property. And even though they, they clean out their whole cultivation space, they keep getting reinfested because it's right outside their door. So just things like this can be like uh, incredible game changers, even though they're actually kind of um, sort, sort of a basic thing. But like when you know that ecology, it just allows you to make a much more wise decision 
and it, it gives you informed consent about how are you going to attack your 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 problem. As you were talking, one thing kind of just pops into the mind, and and I'm like infantile as when as I listen to you a little bit, but whenever I notice that, let's say it's we're five six weeks into into flowering, and out here in Colorado, we always get one snow in September right before October right and right when we get that one snow even if I if even if, and I'm doing outdoor greenhouse even though I put a uh, shade cloth and a plastic over to protect it from the this one snow that will come in drop below and then and then evaporate away literally within a day or two white flies always come three days later right after that you know, and that's kind of like as in in my mind as you say ecology is that kind of like what you're describing as your you're, you're forecasting certain types of pests to follow specific type of uh, environmental events as well. And Absolutely. As, okay. I gave one example right there with the white flies is something I observed. Have you ever, is there other bugs that, I don't want to say it was specific with white flies, but is there other bugs that seem to follow around uh, weather events uh, that you've noticed uh, in your area and other areas specifically for outdoor growing? Yeah, absolutely. Like, for example, I often hear people exclaim that they like people have been growing for like five years, 10 years, 15, 20 years. You know, cannabis aphid was a big one and rice root aphid to a degree as well that I've heard a lot of people say that they never had to deal with any of that. Now, there could be a bunch of different reasons for that. Maybe they were using some uh, insecticidal products that they can't or don't use anymore because they're quite toxic and systemic in the tissue. But I think a lot of it is because of just the general context of not just the environment, but also our socially what we're growing. More people are growing. It's much more open uh, in, in various places, at least uh, to various degrees. And also we've just had more time, sort of like incubation time. So um, even a specialist like the cannabis is going to become more common for that reason. Its host is becoming more uh, transported globally, but also like in the United States and things like that. Then on top of that social context, you've got what you're saying, the sort of environmental context as well. Like, you know, if you don't, even in a place that gets a terrible winter, right, that would normally kill these aphids, um, although they can produce like an egg that's supposed to overwinter. So like that is possible. There could be some that eke out in existence, but um, we still have like people who are growing indoors and in greenhouses and you get this sort of like Darwin's finches situation where uh, they kind of are able to exist in these little islands that allow them that just insulate them from the weather, just like us in our, in our homes. And so that's going to also have a, a strong impact where perhaps you wouldn't have had that before. When people, they can have like a little breeding hub almost. Exactly. Right. And, and it's kind of like a safe haven. Okay. And um, like, for example, a lot of fungi, I feel like uh, a lot of fungal pathogens become much more common, also oomycetes for that matter, when it's like wintry or autumnal, when you get like a lot of the rains in certain parts of the world. Like I live in Southern California, so maybe I'm biased because I find those weather patterns really cool because we never get them. <laughs> never, you know, I rarely get to experience it, perhaps that's why. But it's true, like I get, I have a massive appreciation for like even just a little bit up north the Pacific Northwest, you know, is a lot more, uh, there's a lot more cool stuff going on. Like diverse. Um, yeah. Yeah, exactly. So I think there's a definitely a big role to play in what environment you're growing. I know people who grow out in the desert, in the high desert. So they get a lot of insects at night. There's a lot of cool desert insects going around doing stuff, other arthropods, but they also kind of have a lot of just scrag, scraggy kind of like, you know, not really like voluptuous leaves and lush blood is being grown in the middle and in the, in the mountainous desert but um yeah. so in some ways they don't get the same pests and, and that's been a real big boon for them if that makes sense you know i mean arizona outside is hard i'll start no i was going to say and another good thing to keep in mind is like you're saying through the legalization through more and more states this is going to cause more and more people to share clones be more comfortable sharing clones and just, you know, the transportation of clones alone, I've heard so many people, oh, I got a clone off my buddy and then their whole, their tents in their basement are now infected. So, you know, through the legalization and the normalization of cannabis, I would expect to see a lot more of this stuff to come through. So you, we need to be conscious of where we're getting our products, our clones, 
you know, where we're sourcing our soils and stuff to keep in mind, because it's, it's probably just, just starting to get amped up is how I view it. In a lot of I ways, that is the horror case. stories. Yeah, definitely. Oh, yeah. I mean, I'm sure everyone on this panel is already familiar with like the massive anxiety over like hop latent viroid, for example. Many people I know have been uh, really damaged by like also some of the viruses that are coming up, like a uh, beet curly top virus, for example. Mark made a great uh, question about you know certain pests coming in becoming more problematic at certain times of the year, and B. Curlytop virus is a virus that's like globally found in tons of different crops. It's just one of those viruses that are super common and can go to, get into a lot of species. And this beet leafhopper is like basically the only vector of this virus. Mm. And they become really common, like because we know their life cycle, we know, and we, we also see because this is when people get hit in like California, for example, they will, uh, they will come out of the like, um, the mountains and the sort of chaparral uh, brush and stuff like this. And so actually some plants, some of these non-cultivated plants, they can have the B. colitot virus and they have no symptoms. They're not affected. It's there in the plant, but they have no problem. And so if you're a cultivator and you're even just relying on these like these curly top symptoms to like be like, okay, that's a weed plant that has it. Let me call it so that it doesn't come and infect my plants. Well, it doesn't matter because you won't be able to see every single plant that has it. Meanwhile, the new generation of the leafhopper comes down, drinks the phloem sap, takes up the virus, which could be any number of strains, which have sort of different uh, various intensities as well for different species too. So there's that factor on top of it. Like a code. Just to double check this on my own knowledge base, because again, I, this is me just researching, you know, I find a problem, I research it, try to I try to provide an adequate answer to a solution. So when you're talking about the, the vectors, to my understanding, the aphid is the only one that can do a vector because it punctures it with its with its needle. Is that is are you we talking the disease or the, the virus we're talking about right now is are we talking about the aphid transferring that, or is it another bug that transfers that virus? Beetle, I believe. Uh, no, so so you're close. I mean, that's true. So aphids are prob are definitely they're definitely the one of the most. They're the group of insects that is the most responsible for specifically viral transmission, and it is because their mouth parts have adapted to be like incredibly precise. They weave, they penetrate through the, the skin of the plant. And then they have this like tongue essentially that, that moves through the individual cells and is looking for the phloem sap, the sieve elements. And so that's where it, it basically, and then what happens is it just lets that stuff go in. The, the, the pressure differential is so great uh, for such a small thing that it just shunts right into its body. Yeah. It doesn't have to like try to get that into it. And because of that, that makes viral transmission, like it's amazingly great. Like you don't even necessarily damage individual cells. Sometimes you do, but yeah. So, so insects that have a similar kind of stylet, like leaf hoppers, which like are leaf, that's related. what I was wondering right there. Exactly. So leaf hoppers don't puncture it though, but they can transfer, they can transfer. Well, they the, do puncture it, but they don't, they do not, not quite in the, so they both, they, all of them feed on phloem. So all the hemitera are like, they're in this greater group and they all had this like piercing mouth part and aphids are part of a group called uh, like the aphid, aphidodia or the sternorinca. And the sternorinca group is where you go. I believe that's also white flies. Uh, I might be wrong there, but um, there's a greater group that the aphids are part of and they have close relatives that also have these styles, but all of them have a piercing mouth part. And so, but it's the aphids, the leaf hoppers, the psyllids, uh, are another big group that that also vector like bacteria too sometimes as well like phytoplasmas the third one's the white furry ones right that kind of creates a fur like a uh, on the leaves like a wax like yeah exactly is that white white flies can kind of do that with their like waxy bodies but like scale insects for uh, maybe example. i'm thinking scale maybe i'm thinking scale like mealybugs like mealybugs mealy have that waxy coating yeah is that the is that the third family that you were discussing right there no, uh, like the psyllids. Do you the psyllids. Mean, or, yeah. What type of bugs are those? So scale. So, so the, actually, you know, um, you know, if you want me to, can I share my screen? Yeah, so, please. Uh, this, this is what uh, we're goal too, is to research some of the words you're saying and then share our screen. So other, uh, other followers can be following along. 
so this I, I made on the future cam project I I do a, or I'm starting to do a series of videos about different kinds of pests and I also have pest primer videos on my YouTube channel Xenthanol but this slide was from one of those presentations about rice root aphids and I included because I always like to do this there's sort of like evolutionary context why are aphids so good at what they do because it gives people the idea it allows people to kind of form I think informed decisions and farmers, cultivators are some of the most clever people I've ever experienced. And I feel like people can generally understand, even if, if you put it in a simple way, like for example, so if they're similarly related, certain compounds are also going to have maybe similar effects. And if they're more distantly related, certain compounds we, we find, so this is corroborated with experiments, so that they're, they're not necessarily going to affect each other. So if you're armed with even that basic knowledge, like here, the, uh, the aphidomorpha, right? Those are the aphids and their similar organisms are very closely related. This is a, what do we call a phylogenetic tree. It shows an ancestry of different groups. And so when you categorize them because they're closely related genetically, it just opens you up to like knowing, well, okay, I can see that like if you were trying to see, will this virus or this pathogen, is it more likely or less likely that this other organism you know, can take it up or have similar physiological reactions to like a biocontrol that you're trying to use. This might help you out because usually those genes are conserved, like immune system genes and stuff. So anyways, I'm getting in the weeds, but basically uh, the coccids. Uh, it's 100% fine. Please continue. This is very interesting. Okay, cool. I appreciate it. So these coccids, the coccidomorpha, those are scale insects, but like that's a common term, scale insect, right? And in that group, that greater group, you've got armored scales and you've got soft scales, what we call armored and soft scales. And I don't have that here delineated, but basically mealybugs are in the, um, I think it's the soft scale group. And so they're a special kind of soft scale. And anyways, um, so, they, so you can see that they kind of branch off earlier, but they are in a close you know, they're very close, they're more closely related <clears throat> than like, for example, these guys over here in this other branch. So you've got the, the Elideromorpha, which are the white flies that you talked about earlier, and the psyllids, the psyllodia. So, so the psyllids and the white flies, they aren't super closely related because you see you have this branch back here, but they are more closely related to each other, you could say, than the scale insects and the aphids are for example. Does it go and by like is, the build of their exoskeleton? So that that's point? the more, so that's morphology. And a lot okay. of times morphology can be super helpful for general things, but morphology has also um, misled us in the past, uh, taxonomists and things like that. That's why genes and gene-based phylogenetic trees have become so useful and important for people. Yeah, but, but, but essentially, a lot of times, like for example, I know something's a scale insect because um, it has these different features, but like in some contexts, the reason a lot of things will have similar features because they are not just related, but because they exist in the same environment. So there's convergent evolution, like honeybees have, have wings and an albatross has wings, but they're very different kinds of wings, but you yeah. can have two different species of bee that look almost identical or are identical, but the only difference is like if we take their genes and we can see that they're diverse, or sometimes like it's like behavioral things that you don't, but you aren't able to see it visually. Anyways. How many of these bugs can transfer, um, tell me if I'm saying this right, transfer vector, or is it, it does vectors only go for it with aphids, but which, which one of these can transfer the viruses? So the, um, the aphids are a big one. The psyllids are, are sort of... Not could, you show us, big one. could you show us on that diagram one more time? Just Oh, ones? yeah. So basically these aphids, the aphid group, and the, um, the, uh, the psyllids are a big vector for like bacteria, like phytoplasmas and things. I remember I seeing viruses. their thing. <laughs> I remember they have a horn that they, on their butt, right? They, they stab. Or how do they pierce the the cell wall to transfer the, the, the bottom one. The psyllids have a mouth part too. Oh, that's it's a mouth part. It was a, it was yeah. A, yeah. Okay. The, um, but yeah, so the, so the aphids are a big one. And then the leaf hoppers aren't, aren't, they're, they're over here. They're in the phagoromorphs. They're in the, um, 
they're in a totally different group. So they've branched way earlier. They're in the Ororinka or something like that. So the Sternorinka, so the Sternorinka and the, the Aurinka, or I think I'm forgetting a symbol or a, a syllable there, but basically those two prefixes refer to the position of the mouth part on the head, I believe. So like rhynchus, like rhinoceros, that's like the nose, right? So oh, anyways, cool. yeah, hmm. so so that's just Latin. Um, yeah. Yeah, but you don't have to know that to know, you know, uh, what you're looking at here. It, it's still, every, it's the fun thing about education. Once you, once you start learning and you enjoy it, it, all of it somewhat becomes interesting. Oh, did you did you want to go into the whole uh, MCMA problem real quick about uh, what's going on over there? To bring sure. Some attention so in in the state of Michigan, right now the current legislation that they're trying to push uh, it would re- make it very restrictive on home grow rights. It would re- reduce home grow rights, especially for caregivers, and uh, it's going to restrict access to even patients. 